So we're going to talk about how the gut regulates brain health. Um, and for many years, I've been interested in these topics. Uh, our human ancestors, probably since about the age of 14, because my father studied the origin of life, and I got interested in human origins, if you will. Obviously, I went to medical school, so like a number of you here, we're interested in health. I'm interested in health. I uh, developed an interest in brain health, and in about 2003, in nutrition. And so I knew there were links amongst these topics, but I didn't really know how to put it together. It just didn't come together as a whole for me until I learned about the dark side. And, it, and the dark side is chronic inflammation, okay? And I didn't use this word. Uh, this was used in an article I happened to read in 2010. And Science is the U.S. top scientific journal. If you get published in Science, that's a huge deal. And it was insights of the past decade. And one of them was inflammation's dark side. We know the positive side, which is you get a splinter, you need inflammation to heal. But chronic ongoing inflammation has a dark side. And I'll just go ahead and read this one. Over the past decade, it has become widely accepted that inflammation is a driving force behind chronic diseases that will kill nearly all of us cancer, diabetes, obesity, Alzheimer's disease, atherosclerosis, here inflammation wears a grim mask. And this is what we need to talk about because, frankly, since this time, there's been an explosion of knowledge. It's, it's frankly hard to keep up with it, okay? And here's how then it fell together for me. What I was missing was the gut, okay? Nutrition, what we put in our mouths, if you will, what happens in the gut relates directly to brain health. And that's what we're going to talk about. And behind this was still the ancestors kind of whispering to us. And we'll touch on that a little later on. So we're going to talk about what's being called the gut-brain axis. Some call it the gut-brain highway, however you want to think about it. Okay? And here's the gut-brain axis. We know that we mentally can affect our gut. It's time to go, let's say. We can uh, affect that. What we're learning is what's happening in the gut can affect our brain. Okay? And we're going to dig down into that pretty deeply. So let's begin to learn about the gut or review about the gut. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, large and small intestines, basically. The intestines house about 70 to 80 percent of our immune system. Now imagine you're running a country and you decide to have your defense, 70 to 80 percent of your defense forces in this one area. What does that mean? You know there's a threat there. So our body knows there's a big threat here, okay? The way I'd like to think about it is we know when we've been invaded, okay? If it's a virus, you're going to cough and you're going to sneeze. If it's through your skin, it's going to hurt, you're going to want to heal it. It's what's happening in our gut that uh, basically we need to defend against. And let's look at that a little further. So let's drill down. This is a detailed view of uh, uh, part of the intestine. This is here, the lumen, is the outside world, right? It is going to, um, what's happening here is very important. These are villi. We're going to look at those uh, in a minute that do a lot of the processing. The bottom line is this whole area is surrounded by hundreds of millions of nerve cells. As a matter of fact, it's often called the second brain or the brain in our gut. So we need to think of the nervous system, uh, the enteric nervous system. We've not studied that very well. So let's look at those microvilli, which are at the core. So these are these little uh, microvilli. They have a nerve running in. They have an artery and they have a vein. Okay, Here's what it looks like on an anatomy slide. 
Again, this is the outside world. This is where all the processing goes, okay? If our intestines were spread out, basically it'd be close to a, a tennis uh, court, okay? That's how much absorbative surface we have, 30 square meters, okay? Each microvilli, again, has nerves, et cetera. What's inside? Of course, we know there's 100 trillion microorganisms in our intestines of 10,000 different species. A neurologist that studies this in detail, put simply, they are in charge of your health. So if the, if the microorganisms in our gut are in charge of our health, we better treat them properly or colonize the ones that we want, if you will. So what does the gut do? It absorbs nutrients, obviously. It detoxifies, but it creates neurotransmitters and vitamins. 80 to 90% of a neurotransmitter called serotonin is produced in the gut, 80 to 90%. And this is the feel-good neurotransmitter. The function is of serotonin. It regulates mood. It helps you feel more emotionally stable, less anxious, more focused, happier, and calmer. It's produced in our gut. If it's not produced well, we're not going to feel like that. It regulates your appetite digestion. It also contributes to sleep. The speed of memory is now being studied as to what's going on in our gut. Depends on our memory. Uh, a deficiency in serotonin, depression, anxiety, panic. Uh, recently, possible role of serotonin deficiency in ADHD. So what is this actual highway? Not only is it the blood vessels, but it's the vagal nerve, the vagus nerve, okay? It, it innervates our intestines. And now we're learning that what's happening here can act, travels up to the brain very quickly. So the highway has got maybe, say, three uh, different lanes, if you will. It's got arteries and veins, and then it's got the nerves that are coming in and out. So it's a complex highway. Now this is a real nitty-gritty slide, but there are a few words in here that we're going to need to begin to learn and think about because this is what's being learned. So again, you're going to have lunch. So from the gut, it will be metabolized. So that's a metabolite, OK? Depending on that metabolite, it's going to affect the microglia. So microglia is one of the words to begin to think about. It's probably going to be more in the press as we go along. They're the immune cells in our brain. They're the ones that are defending the brain, if you will, OK, microglia. Okay. Now, depending on this metabolite, the microglia are either going to uh, inflame the astrocyte or calm it. So now they're following the path all the way from what goes into the gut to the astrocyte, which is a brain cell. What does the astrocyte do? It regulates your synapses, neuronal firing. It protects your neurons from oxidative damage. So again, the tracks now are being really nailed down. And that is called neuroinflammation, is the general term, where our brain cells, uh, our spinal cord, our peripheral nerves can be inflamed. The best uh, way to understand how this happens is to learn about celiac disease, or to talk about celiac disease. And I'm sure many of you have heard about it. It's a disease of children. It's due to gluten in genetically susceptible patients. In other words, a lot of us can have gluten and have no issue. But some, as we know, cannot handle gluten. They have a whole bunch of things. They are short-statured, et cetera, et cetera. But they're irritable. They have behavioral issues. They may have ADHD. Uh, they may have fatigue, depression, anxiety, neuropathy, seizures, or migraines. So certainly gluten can be a neurological problem. The question is, how does it, how does it affect us? Uh, why are we defending? And here's the battleground. Basically, this is what we need to learn. There's only, a, so this is the outside world as we talked about. There's only a single cell layer protecting us from the outside world, okay? Gluten is sneaky. It's able to pry these cells apart 
and get in when it's not supposed to. Okay? And then the body is sending a bunch of lymphocytes and trying to defend it. Oh my God, gluten's breaking in. We've got to fight that. The battle, eventually some of our cells lose. We have a leaky gut. Not only do things leak out into the gut, but bad things then leak into the gut. That's the term leaky gut that you hear about. Okay. And how does it do it? it uh, uh, gliadin in gl the gluten protein that's mostly in wheat and rye can be in oats if they're processed in the same factory and lectins and glycoalkaloids in potatoes and cereals and beans and enzymes inhibitors can open that tight junction. This is a micro photograph showing us how the cells are, are sealed together. These things break through. And that's why people that, can, uh, that are gluten uh, allergic, the, it breaks through and can cause um, all the neurological. Here is a uh, micro slide of our normal gut lining this is a break-in, okay? All the, it's very swollen. Uh, the lymphocytes, the immune cells are trying to battle the breakdown. Um, and uh, and uh, 42,000 children die each year in the world today from this battle. Because they're, they're eating gluten that they don't know they're allergic to, okay? But fortunately, fortunately, we have that blood-brain barrier. We learned in medical school, nursing school, et cetera. We've got this extra barrier. Well, unfortunately, the blood-brain barrier has the same type junctions. And those, now we're learning, can be pried in. So again, now we're seeing how these effects are coming up to the brain. What can open these? Wheat lectins can open it. Um, and some other substances that are being looked at. So what happens in uh, children that have consume a lot of gluten, or people that consume, they're allergic to gluten, what can happen neurologically? They can get ataxia. It's an autoimmune disease. The, the body's trying to fight off the gluten, but it mistakes our cerebellar cells, the Purkinje cells, and destroys them, so we have ataxia. If it hits our spinal ganglion, we can have numbness, tingling, and coordination. If it hits our peripheral nerves, burning, numbness, tingling, et cetera. And this is a new way, it, uh, it's only one case, uh, but what it says is there, there's, there's been a debate. About 1% of us might be uh, gluten uh, um, allergic. The question is, how about gluten sensitivity? Okay. It's been argued maybe around 19%. Some say, oh, that's way overdone. Others say, no, it's not. This is a case of gluten sensitivity. This young woman at 14 was not allergic to gluten. Okay? She had a sensitivity. She then started having complex hallucinations, saw people coming out of the TV to scare her, and had, had hypnagogic hallucinations, which are very frightening dreams, basically. And, and, so uh, they took her off gluten and it resolved within a week. So this is called gluten psychosis, okay? Um, so that's the model that we are now looking at the brain diseases with. Uh, we've heard about celiac disease, but what about depression? Inflammation and depression, there's now evidence that depression is the clinical expression of inflammation. This shows that depression belongs in the spectrum of inflammatory and degenerative disorders. So although there is a situational depression, we've lost someone, there's been a bad problem or whatever, it's depressing. But we all know people that have sort of this chronic depression without clear reasons. And you know we lost two prominent people earlier this year, Cade Spade and Anthony Bourdain. And I don't know their situations, but we have to wonder was it more than psychological? Um, neuroinflammation and suicidal thinking. Okay, uh, again, I talked about Bourdain and, and, and Spade. Uh, this is a fascinating study. It's small, it has to be replicated. Um, what they did is they took uh, 14 people with major depression episode, clearly, nine of them had recent suicidal thoughts. And then they did a PET scan 
uh, which is, it looks at the biochemistry of the brain. And then they looked at the microglia, and only in those with suicidal ideation were the microglia inflamed. Now, to me, that's to pick all nine of them out that had expressed that, this has to be replicated. If it's true, then in someone with depression, we can scan them and see if they're, su if they're suicidal to know which are the more severe. We'll have to wait and see, okay? Um, whole foods lower the risk of depression. And this is a study where they compared uh, in over 3,000 people processed food to whole foods. People who ate processed foods more likely to be diagnosed with depression. A whole food diet heavily loaded with vegetables, fruits, and fish was protective against depression. So if you know someone that's depressed, then look at what they're eating and try to help them in a gentle way that you can. What about memory and thinking? A high fructose diet, which surrounds us as you all know, alters your ability to learn and remember information. Uh, Omega-3s, which are a good anti-inflammatory fat, can minimize the damage. So if you've got a kid that's eating just too much junk, well, get, slip in some omega-3s in there, you know, at least give them some protection, okay? What about um, um, inflammation and thinking? Uh, basically, uh, CRP, as some of you probably know, is an inflammatory marker. We can draw the blood tests and see if people are inflamed. If they're inflamed, We've, they've shown that there's cerebral microstructural disintegration that predominantly affects the frontal f pathways and executive function. And that's a pretty darn scary sentence. None of us want cerebral microstructural degeneration. So uh, the evidence is building pretty strong. It's not completely in agreement. Don't get me wrong, this is still early. Uh, you worried about memory a little bit? Well, in, it looks like the gut vagal signals impact uh, memory control, okay? So they've tracked from the gut through the vagus nerve right to the hippocampus, which is our main memory area. That's been tracked, okay? In the future, medical students are gonna learn this up front. We didn't learn this. None of us learned this. We didn't know it. What about dementia? One in eight people above 65 are going to have dementia. Nearly half of those 85 have Alzheimer's. Glenn Campbell passed away at 2017 from that disorder. Excess of dietary carbohydrates, particularly fructose, along with a deficiency in dietary fats and cholesterol may lead to Alzheimer's disease. We found increased risk was associated with higher glucose levels. Um, and this is important because if somebody has prediabetes, they're at a greater risk of dementia, okay? We randomly assign, now this is a small study, uh, to high carb or low carb diet. Very low carb diet consumption can improve memory function in older adults with increased risk. Omega-3 fatty acids can reduce the risk of cognitive decline. 60 patients with Alzheimer's were randomized, and we know we all like the better, stronger, randomized studies. Half were given milk and half were given probiotics to look like milk, so you didn't know what you were getting. And then they did cognitive testing, this MMSE score, okay, to see how they did. Um, I don't know how long the study was, but basically they found uh, scores in those, um, with a mixture of probiotics going up from 8.6 to 10.7. I don't know what that means, but what they say is that's a huge improvement in that scale, okay? So at least we know some ways we can protect. And actually, there are special clinics developing throughout the country for people with disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease that are already using some of this new knowledge. And indeed, some uh, dementia patients are being stabilized and to a degree being improved. I can't say all, and these are small studies. What about Parkinson's disease? Well, interestingly, Dr. Parkinson in 1817 described 
six cases that took his name. He just called it the shaking palsy. It became Parkinson's disease. Interestingly, one case had gastrointestinal complaints that improved with treatment. Wouldn't it have been fascinating if somebody would have picked that case up and thought about it and studied it more? We might have learned 200 years ago that Parkinson's may be mostly a nutritional disorder of what's going on in the gut. Um, Alan Alda recently announced, or this past year announced, he has Parkinson's disease. It affects a million people in the U.S., 60,000 new cases a year, uh, more men than women, average age of onset at 60. Parkinson's is believed to be caused by chronic low-grade inflammation in the gut. Now, it's not the only cause. I mean, people living closer to pesticides seem to have a higher incidence, so there are probably other reasons. but. Um, but anyway, uh, again, so here's a recent article this year in Scientific American. Does Parkinson's uh, begin in the gut? Uh, the vagus nerve may be the prime now. Again, you're learning the, the, the pieces, the microglia, the vagus nerve, etc. The vagus nerve may be the primary route through which pathological triggers of Parkinson's travel from the GI to the brain. Microbes, again, we learned about microbes, we know about microbes, acting through the metabolites, the things that are produced in our gut, to activate the microglia. So again, various lines of evidence are starting to nail this down. Interestingly, an infusion of ketone bodies, in mice at least, helps protect from the neurodegeneration and motor deficit. We'll touch a little bit on the keto diet a bit later on. Keto bodies may be a novel neuroprotective therapy for Parkinson's disease. And again, some of these advanced clinics. And then I'll just fi finish this section on, there's a number of other disorders that are now, at least in part, being linked to the gut, at least in part. And here they are. And we, we've heard of all of these, ADHD, ALS, anorexia nervosa, autism, anxiety, chronic fatigue, OCD, um, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, we've all thought as a big psychiatric disease. Uh, there's a lot of information that, yes, there can be psychiatric components, but it is uh, nutritional, inflammatory, probably not just nutritional inflammatory. There are other nutritional uh, inflammatory pathways. Um, so it's an exciting time to try to take a new look at these disorders. Now, I've talked about neuroinflammation so far from nutrition. They, I just want to make sure people understand there are other causes for our nervous system to be inflamed, okay? Uh, we talked about the first one, but a bacteria or virus, traumatic brain injury, passive smoke, air pollution, loss of sleep and stress, where inflammatory markers can go up, okay? Uh, I'll mention this. This is a stress. This is they took uh, married couples, and uh, 43 healthy married couples between 24 and 61 years old, they were to discuss, and they were videotaped, they were to discuss amongst themselves, by themselves, topics that were stressful, and that would be things, uh, either money or in-laws for 20 minutes, and they were videotaped. Their blood was drawn before the video and after. Uh, those that had more markedly hostile fights, biomarkers indicated a leaky gut and a high C-reactive protein, the primary marker of inflammation. So you just want to chill, okay? All right, so those are some of the neurologic disorders we're studying. How did we get off track? Because these disorders, frankly, were not that common. And in some of the native tribes that are still, available, like in New Guinea, Alzheimer's is a rare, dementia is rare. Uh, so it's a modern disease is the way to think about we're causing it in some ways, and we're starting to nail down how we're causing it. We got off track up front with the agricultural revolution. Of course, we had to have it to be here. I wouldn't be here without the agricultural revolution, okay? Uh, we probably started collecting grains about 30,000 years ago. We started farming about 12,000 years ago, but we built our cities, okay? Um, but what happened is men uh, lost uh, about five inches 
uh, women lost about three inches in height, so we became shorter when we became farmers. Uh, people say to me, yeah, but those people didn't live very long, okay, if you're back in the, in, before farming. Well, uh, in the late Paleolithic, the average age for men and women is here, 35. It, it actually tended to drop until Imperial Rome, when they did better, uh, dropped again. And it's only in the uh, 1800s or so that we finally had this upswing in longevity, which now in the U.S. is plateauing and predicted to slightly come down. Now, unfortunately, some of that is uh, drug use in the, in the U.S. And with farming, since we live close to animals, we started getting diseases uh, transmitted and deficiencies because we were eating more grains and stuff. Um, and I won't go into this in detail, but early farmers were sicker and shorter than their forager ancestors. On the other hand, we can't feed the world without grains. There's just no way, right? Nine billion people without farming, it's just not going to happen. Another way we got uh, into this fix, if you will, was food processing, okay? Uh, and uh, Edward Bernays was Sigmund Freud's nephew. He used psychoanalytic thinking to change us from citizens to consumers. During that era, era, he believed that the masses were irrational. Now, World War I was in memory of a lot of people, so they did see human irrationality unleashed, if you will. Um, but he brought psychoanalytic uh, processes to advertising. Prior to that time, we, people were generally buying what they needed. Today, we buy what we want. We don't necessarily need, but we want, okay? So, so, um, so Procter & Gamble uh, bought this product that they later then uh, created as Crisco to um, sell to the public. But Procter & Gamble was concerned. This is artificial, essentially. How are people gonna, are people gonna buy this? They were concerned, so they hired Bernays. And Bernays decided to sweeten the deal up and create this campaign. Here's, an open, here's a prairie, an opening window, a young child looking at, lovingly at the mother and what's going on there. Well, sure, I want to buy Crisco, okay? I mean, gosh, this looks great, okay? And it's going to last on my shelf longer. What they didn't know and tell us later on is it had 50% trans fat. It was artificial. You create it by hydrogenation, heating the oil up, putting it under pressure, adding hydrogen, nickel, or platinum. Okay, and what it said, and it killed about 30 to 100,000 premature deaths a year. So, if any of us had relatives in the past 50, 75, or more years that died of cardiovascular disease, you wonder if there's Crisco involved. Certainly, we had it in our family when we were growing up. Only in 2018, although this has been known now for 15, 20 years, only in 2018 has the U.S. government said, we've got to get this out of the food. Unfortunately, the replacements may not be as good. So one of the key factors in artificial foods, if it contains these hydrogenated pressurized oils, is inflammatory changes to the nervous system. Okay. Now, Bernays kept on going and others took up the, the call and for years we had advertisements like sugar might just be the willpower you need or why not feed your little baby uh, or have your little baby drink 7-Up. Unfortunately, these ads are still present. They're subtler. We, don't, we, we react to the message, but we don't think of it as uh, a con, if you will, or I'm a consumer, buy me, I'm going to sweeten the deal for you, so to speak. The other thing, other reason we went off track, and this is a, a real, it's a short episode, but it's left a lot of lasting consequences. It's one of the later mistakes that we made, uh, and we villainized fat. And unfortunately, now during that era, maybe paying off Harvard scientists, you know, and maybe you could argue 50, 50,000 in 1960, but basically that's what happened. Harvard scientists received $50,000 so they could shift 
minimize the link between sugar and heart health and cast aspersions on fat, okay? Because the sugar lobby happens to be very strong in this country. There are other lobbies that are strong, so I can't just pick on them. Uh, and Dr. Hegstead from Harvard ended up being uh, on the guidelines uh, group uh, that ended up going to Congress to the McGovern Commission, the Select Commission on Nutrition, that basically said to the U.S. and all of us, we need to reduce fat. Well, what happens if you reduce fat in food? You have to add sugar. People, it's, it doesn't taste good. So you add sugar. That's why for many years, a lot of our food has had sugar. And unfortunately, it's uh, highly inflammatory, high fructose corn syrup, because that's cheap, okay? Uh, and here's what Dr. Rittman, a cardi chief of cardiology for many years that lived through that area. Unfortunately, these recommendations were not only wrong, they were dangerously wrong. They have helped lead the way to the present epidemics in type 2 diabetes, obesity, coronary artery disease, and hypertension. Now, the final mistake was the pyramid, okay? Uh, that's why I put oops. I've heard that maybe there was industrial uh, influence into having grain being uh, at the bottom, at the base of the pyramid but I haven't searched that, so I can't confirm uh, whether there was influence or not from the industry. But the problem, here is the human diet before farming in terms of omega-6 and omega-3. And if you wanna begin to think of some health things, and many of you probably already know, omega-3s are very anti-inflammatory. They're very healthful for us. But we do need some omega-6s. They have important roles as well. Okay, the thing is, but these are inflammatory if we have a lot. So omega-3 good, omega-6 bad, but you need a balance, and the ancestral human diet was one-to-one. -one. That's a great balance, okay? The food pyramid diet is 15-to-1. It was a very inflammatory recommendation, okay? All right, so what should we eat? Let's kind of try to get to solutions a little bit. Well, the way I think of it is that we've gone through three eras of diet, or we're in the third era. The ancestral human diet, which we ate and consumed for 50,000 generations, okay, or two and a half uh, billion, uh, million years ago. The Paleolithic basically started with the first stone tools, okay, that's how it's measured. Uh, and then we came to an agricultural based diet, which we've been talking about. We've consumed that about 500 generations. And since processed foods, we've only consumed it by about four generations. We're heavily going into the processed age diet. We at least need to bump back to dropping most of this processed food and going to this. And some people want to go back to that. Although you can't go back and eat as well as our ancestors did. The food was very different. Uh, the vegetables were very fibrous. The fruits weren't as sweet. Uh, and of course, the, the animal protein was not uh, farm fed, if you will. So let's go real quickly. They ate lots of vegetables, which have a long list of nutrients. Their vegetables were much more fibrous. Uh, they ate about 100 to 300 grams of fiber per day, it's estimated. We average about 15 grams. Uh, this is a very important cave. I, I want to go there sometime. It's at the tip of South Africa. A lot happened there. But um, thousands of years ago, uh, the ocean level was lower. So they actually had estuaries here. So these folks that lived in these caves, this is one the only one, could go out and collect their, uh, their nutrition. And in that area of South Africa, if you look at it here in detail, in this area there were a lot of plants, about 9,000 9, species. So they had access to lots of plants, lots of sea life, and I'm sure some other um, you know, animal life. This has just been uh, reported in the past couple of weeks from that cave, Blombos Cave. These are the oldest uh, and if you look at those, to me those look like they're drawn by humans. Uh, these are the oldest uh, art 
uh, cave paintings ever documented. They're actually shocking. Uh, 20 years ago, I would have said 30,000 years old as the oldest uh, paintings, etc. So it really kind of shocked us. Um, and I will finally say that it, it's possible that that human colony is the colony that eventually spread to the earth. So if we, because we know it was a small population, that's been known, it's just where they came from. If we understand that, we want to know more about these folks, you know. How important was that seafood for them to have the brain advancement that the others around didn't, for instance, but I'll have to move on. They ate root vegetables. They uh, ate dense vegetables. They contained fructose, but a low glycemic incidence. Uh, they did not eat dairy because they could not handle these animals to, <laughs> to get <laughs> milk. So it doesn't mean dairy's bad. It's just they didn't eat it because <laughs> you know, of that issue. Uh, they ate natural protein. Uh, it's a great source of uh, good cholesterol, amino acids, neurotransmitters, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, a lot of our uh, beef, if you will, now is farmed. Uh, and that then, the, at least in some reports, the omega-6 is 20 to 1. So, so when you see these studies, all these people ate too much protein and therefore they didn't do as well, my question is, okay, what kind of protein? If it's inflammatory protein, yeah. Now, we can't all eat grass-fed beef, and, and I understand that. The other thing is if you're eating bison steak, your saturated fat is one-tenth of a T-bone steak. So our ancestors ate protein in beef, but it's not the same kind, okay? Uh, now, our ancestors' uh, cattle did not eat red Skittles. So this was a truck that uh, apparently had a crash on the freeway, and the, they started investigating while these red Skittles spilled out. They were going to feed cattle. They, they didn't, you know. Um, and then, again, grass-fed beef is high in omega-3s. It neutralizes inflammation caused by omega-6s. Uh, but there is a moral dilemma. I won't dwell on it. And because I know there are uh, you know, vegetarians and vegans, and there's a moral dilemma. Back then, in um, ancestral times, there was more of an uh, equivalence, if you will. This is what I believe is probably the first story that I can interpret and has been interpreted. This is in one of the caves in northern Spain 23 to 25,000 years ago. The bison is dead. It's been uh, eviscerated, if you will. The human is dead, and the, this has been uh, interpreted as the broken spear. So it's a story that there was a loss there, okay? Nowadays, uh, we don't, we're not put into that jeopardy. We go into the grocery store. The only thing is maybe a cart bumping ours, right? And it's in nice saran wrap. So I can understand the moral dilemma. I'm not a vegetarian myself, I'll just let you know that, but I can understand that moral dilemma. All this says basically is, again, there are studies, there's a big study, again, supported by Harvard. I don't think they had anything undercover on that, uh, that basically said, oh my gosh, you know, uh, paleo diets and keto diets, et cetera. But they didn't report what the protein was taken, and it's apparently a study over about 30 years, and the, every six years or so they had to fill out a questionnaire what you ate the past six years. I'm sorry, that just seems a little concerning. The bottom line is there's counter evidence that eating most dairy and red meat saw their chances of early death fall and fatal heart attacks decrease by 22%. So there's a, give, there's a ping pong kind of situation from different papers on this issue, and I'm sure uh, natural fats are very good for us. I won't go through that in detail. The question is, what about grains? Okay, we've you know, I've hit hard on grains, if you will, became shorter, et cetera, but we can't feed the world without uh, grains, okay? So what about an in each individual? There's not one diet for all of us. What about us, okay? So who are you? Uh, are you, in other words, what's your genetic background? You know, if we have Asian descent, we might tolerate rice a lot better. If we have Mediterranean descent, we might have tolerate this, et cetera. So who are we? What's, an what's our ancestry? Are you currently healthy? What about your body mass? What kind of grains are you consuming? And how many kinds of grains? So I think grains can be part of the diet. I just think we have to consider these factors. But 
Even Diabetes Journal says, when compared with ancestral diets, the modern diet with dense acellular, high, acellular carbohydrates promotes inflammatory microbiota and may be the primary cause of leptin resistance and obesity. So even they recognize that our diet is an issue. This is uh, reported just uh, this, this year. These are the, the tsunami that live in the Amazon rainforest. Um, they're partly westernized. I'll show you their diet here in a minute. Um, they only eat what they can grow or catch. Non-processed carbs such as rice, plantains, corn, nuts, fruits, lean wild game and fish. Okay? So they do have some uh, grains, if you will, in their diet. Okay? But you can see there's no processed food, basically. They, they, they try to catch, well, they have to. They have to catch what they eat, right? It's not try to. You don't go to the store because it's far away. But uh, let me see. But 700 of them agreed to, be, uh, to go to Trinidad and have their arteries scanned. That's what's cool about this. They had their CT scan so we could see how their arteries were. This is how they live. Uh, we found that based on their lifestyle, 85% of this population can live their whole life without, without any heart artery atherosclerosis. They basically have physiology of a 20-year-old. The tsunami also have lower heart rates, blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar levels compared to the rest of the world. In the group they interviewed, all those people, they had only heard of one heart, heart attack. So clearly there's a way forward, okay? We're learning from what we know of our ancestors and some of the tribes are studying now. There is a way forward out of our current situation. Uh, can you be a uh, vegetarian or vegan and be healthy? Yes. You just have to remember you have to keep on these possible deficiencies. I can't go through them but just be conscious about it. And be concerned if you're gonna have your young child go vegetarian or vegan, because that's a very important time for the brain to grow. And are they gonna be deficient of their fatty acids that are so important to brain development, et cetera, et cetera. So what should we do? Well, for providers, what I suggest, first of all, we've created our own documents. It's hard to know how effective these are, but we're trying. Okay, uh, the power of nutrition, for instance, um, done by Deborah Truex here at the hospital, um, basically a six pager that's a very strong way to get a good start on nutrition and health, and y'all are certainly welcome to a copy of this. We're happy to get to you. But I think for medicine, we need to start shifting some of our thinking. Right now, a lot of what we do is, uh, it's what, what's going on, what's the disease, and what's the drug, okay? That's a little harsh, we do more than that. I mean, certainly if a trauma person comes in right now, they can have a miracle salvage, so don't get me wrong. But often it's, oh, you've got this, here's the drug, okay? Um, we've gotta realize that there's, uh, food is medicine itself, and there's a, start, a growing movement on that. It's called the Food is Medicine Coalition. It started in Philadelphia. They deliver meals to patients, in this case, with diabetes, heart disease, malnutrition. They saw a 28% reduction in inpatient hospitalization, 9% reduction in ED visits. Boston took it over, 16% healthcare savings. That is a huge number. That's significant, okay? California is going to do it. They're going to look at 1,000 people with congestive heart failure. They'll receive carefully curated breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two in-home visits by registered dietitians. So here, uh, food is at the root of our health, I guess is what it sums up. What do we do as individuals? I mean, I think that's the final question a lot of us want to know is, okay, well, um, you know, you have to begin to ask, oh, who am I and what issues might I have? Do I have any of these conditions, for instance? Um, you might also uh, learn to read the labels. 
Um, they are hard to read, um, but let me show you just one here. So this is a candy bar. This is um, by Adam online. Uh, and the key thing, as we know, is we have to know the serving size. We can't use those numbers unless we know, okay? It looks small, but oh, there are four servings. I can only have a quarter of that, okay? But what's interesting to me is when they published this, they didn't comment or highlight sugars, 41, okay? And that's certainly what I look at if I'm having something that's processed, 41. What does the American Heart Association's Associations say our added sugars should be maximum 25 grams for women, 37 grams for men. So we've shot our daily budget of um, added sugars with one candy bar. Okay. Um, but personally then, my sense is there are several options for us. One is we certainly want to move to a more Mediterranean type diet, if you will. It does have grains in it. I grew up in the Mediterranean world. Um, there are two variants of the Mediterranean diet. The DASH diet, which is dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And there's a newer variant called the MIND diet. If you have anyone in the family with cognitive issues, any cognitive disorder, say dementia, um, I would look at the MIND diet. It's specifically tailored. It's uh, called the Mediterranean DASH. It should be intervention for neurodegenerative delay, okay? And it's indeed stabilizing some people and to a bit of a degree improving some people in terms, you know, she, she's talking to me more. She's sort of more interactive or she recognized me. And that can be huge in that condition, as you know. Or if you're already think you're kind of hovering at this level of balanced, if you will, diet uh, with that minimal processed, well, maybe you want to go to ancestral nutrition. Um, there's paleo, which you've heard about. I think it's been overhyped online. It's often seen as you eat only meat and you go out and catch your own, et cetera. And you, you, we know that some of the tribes, some of them had as little as 5% animal protein. So paleo diet was actually very varied, if you will. Um, if you're going to choose paleo, you might start with primal and maybe stay with primal. It allows some ancient grains. Okay, it's a little more flexible. Okay, and the lead advocate of primal is just very knowledgeable, uh, Mark Sisson. Now, if you've got health issues you're trying to deal with, then you might want to consider the ketogenic diet. My gut feeling is, because I've looked at a number of books on it, my gut feeling is I'd like to find a practitioner to work with. Nurse practitioner, dietitian, physician, somebody that can guide me, okay? Because the books really are all over the place. But the bottom line, where, where does the keto diet come from? The brain can only use two things for energy, glucose and ketones, okay? We primarily survive on, on glucose. It's viewed as, by some, it's viewed as a dirty, slow-burning fuel, okay? Ketones are viewed as a clean, fast-burning fuel. So that's just a way to kind of keep it in mind. Um, what, what's going on with keto? Well, keto can actually be quite regenerative into a lot of health conditions and processes. You don't want to be in keto all the time. Where does keto come from? Well, our ancestors went ketotic every now and then. When they were starving or couldn't find food, they didn't eat. And their bodies went ketotic. They burned their own fat. They had ketones. It triggered genes. Their brain cells grew. Their muscles grew, etc. It's almost like a defensive strategy. So if you uh, you know, you've got a race coming up in a few weeks, a month or so. You might want to go ketotic during that time. There's, uh, there's a, a fella here in the hospital that indeed uh, periodically goes ketotic. The other time you might want to go ketotic is you are flying overseas, which is kind of inflammatory to begin with. The air, the change in sleep. But ketosis can prevent you from that jet lag or at least make it much more minimal. And again, if you need that burst of health, if you will, which I've done it very little. I've tried it a few times. I'm still looking for the right recipe. But it, uh, you're not hungry. People, 
I mean, your hunger is satisfied. When we're hungry is when we eat those grains, right? Oh my gosh, they're good. They give us that burst of energy. Insulin goes in there and pulls all that glucose out of the bloodstream, shoves it into the cells, right? Those cells eventually become resistant, and that's diabetes, okay? So what happens is then it comes out of our system, and then we've got that down, and then I've got to have more, more of the, the fast, you know, the, the carb, if you will. All right, so we're almost there. So I, I realize uh, that uh, natural foods can certainly be more expensive. I mean, it's just the reality of the world we live in. Uh, this is a uh, family garden along the High Line Canal Trail that uh, we rode by some weeks ago. Uh, this is my spouse and I. Uh, we were up in the mountains. Uh, oh, it's been a couple of months or so. Beautiful community garden. So there are ways, if you will, uh, to eat better. Uh, this is fascinating to me. If you're looking for a new home, if you will, and you want to live in the Parker area, which a lot of people do, obviously, uh, in Douglas County, Franktown, just south of Parker, there's going to be a development that is also going to be a farm. There will actually be somebody that's managing the farm. Uh, row gardens, fruit orchard, wildflowers, berry picking patch, hen house, beehives. So what a wonderful place to grow, raise children if you want them to contact. Um, and there are other areas in the country that these activities are developing. Uh, or if you're in a city, what about a rooftop garden? Okay. Or as I know we're having more of an influx into the big cities from the small towns. Some small towns in different areas are slowly fading. So there is a migration into our cities. But there are some people in our cities that are saying, ah, oh, we're going the other way. So some of the young folks, and not necessarily young for others, are trying out a more rural lifestyle, okay? There are a lot of advantages to it. If anything, clean air, less noise, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. Um, anyway, let me uh, just summarize. Um, one of the things, I think, is know your numbers, okay? And the numbers we use uh, at the Chiari Institute, here we are a neurosurgery center, but we're checking basic health numbers because they're not checked that often. So if you haven't had your vitamin D level checked in a few years, ask your doctor, partner with your doctor to measure your vitamin D. We measure it in all our patients at the Chiari Institute. Uh, we surveyed back uh, some patients. We found 73% were deficient, and some were quite low. And so here they're coming in. They're, they're moody. They're depressed. Their memory is affected. They do have a Chiari. But how do I know it's the Chiari fully? I need to address the basic dysfunction, the nutritional dysfunction. Yes, they may well need a Chiari procedure, but we need to address that as well. So vitamin D is a number we use. Hemoglobin A1C is another number we use. It's been uncommon for us to diagnose diabetes in our neurosurgery clinic, but we diagnose a fair amount of prediabetes. We want to know, if we're going to get something, we want to know at the pre-stage before it's at the real stage. Okay? So if you haven't had your hemoglobin A1C, whether you think you're healthy or not, in, you know, in some time, your family doctor will be happy to do that. If your numbers are starting to creep up into that pre-diabetic stage, now's the time to do it. Now's the time to, you know, then you kind of turn the car a little bit like this instead of, oh my God, you know, I don't want to be on insulin, et cetera, et cetera, okay? The, uh, the final number that we uh, look at is, uh, he, um, um, HSCRP, high sensitivity CRP, it's an inflammatory marker, okay? And that really sends an alert when I see that. If that's high, they have Chiari, we need to make sure we understand why they're inflamed, okay? They may have, for instance, pseudotumor uh, cerebri, which is a brain pressure condition. It pushes the tonsils down. If I operate on that, those tonsils will go further down and there may be a stroke. And those cases have been reported in the literature. They're uncommon. So it's very important for us to understand some of these numbers. Now, there may be other numbers that you want. These are the general ones we use. I'm not a 
general medicine clinic. I don't do a whole lot more than that. I then refer back to their family doctor or help them find a family doctor. But you yourself may need numbers somewhere else. Your family doctor is going to be there for you. We have to partner with them. We should be the ones driving the process, not them. Sure, they can tell us, you know, it's time for your so-and-so, and a good doc will do that for you. But sometimes you can see how overwhelmed they are. And sometimes the appointments are 15 minutes. So come in with your agenda. Let them kind of summarize whatever. I mean, again, it's a partnership. But, you know, I'd also, from my, you know, I haven't had my vitamin D checked or whatever it is, whatever you might be low on, okay? We can get this information now. We couldn't before, okay? Um, so know your numbers. And the final slide to summarize is that if we take care of our gut, the gut takes care of us. I think that's the main message.